Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Eric To for those in Israel, and a uh, pleasure to welcome back Dr. Winter, Rebecca Winter, to, uh, to complete our tag team series, the four-part series on um, Tshuva in Tanakh, along with her her Chavrusa, you know, Jennifer Raskus, who gave two of the classes, and now Rebecca will give the last class on um, Kain, Hevel, and Temptation. So, Vakasha. All Rebecca. right, it's great to see everyone. Thank you for coming out, especially during this um, in between time when everybody is in, in the Chagi mode. Rabbi Kalman, I think I did send you the sources. I see somebody would like them. Um, but I'm going to post share them. my screen. I'll post it in a second. Once we get started, I okay. will. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll post them too. Yeah. But yes, no you should ask me. Thank you. No problem. I'm going to uh, share my screen with everybody. Hang on. If I could get this up, sorry. Ah, okay, there we go. It's giving me some trouble, but hopefully everybody could see that now. Um, and I'll put it on slideshow. All right, so um, welcome everybody. This is, as Rabbi Kalman said, it's our last installment of this series. Um, and we are going to be exploring the story of Kain and Hevel together, which I think will give us a, hopefully a nice model or a new model for looking at Shuva in general. And so what I'd like to do is, first I'm gonna briefly summarize the story of Kain and Hevel, Hevel, and then I'm going to zoom out and discuss one aspect of the story that we'll start this year off with. So I think the story of Cain and Hevel is well known, it's pretty famous or infamous, but I'd like to just summarize it very briefly. And quickly, Cain and, um, sorry, Adam and Chava, the first two people on earth, they have two sons, Cain and Hevel. And Cain is a farmer, he's a Ved Adama, and Hevel is a shepherd. And they both bring offerings to Hashem, and for some reason, and we're not given the reason why, Hashem turns towards Hevel's offering and turns away from Kain. From he doesn't turn to Kain. So it seems like he accepts um, Hevel's offering. And so Kain is very upset about this and Hashem visits him. He says, why are you so angry? Um, you could do better, Kain. You know, buck up. We'll discuss what Hashem says to Kain soon. And um, then Cain and Hevel are talking in a field and Cain rises up and kills his brother Hevel. And Hashem famously says to Cain, where is Hevel your brother? And Aye Hevel Achicha and Cain famously responds to Hashem, Hashomer Achianochi, am I my brother's keeper? And Hashem says, your brother's blood is calling out to me from the earth. And because of that, you'll never again be able to work the land. You'll never be able to produce from the land. And you'll always be a wanderer in the land. And Cain says, this is terrible. This is too much. We'll talk about what Cain says to God. And fine, Hashem says, you know what? Okay, I'm not going to make your punishment as bad. Um, it will, you'll be able to last for seven generations and anyone who tries to kill you Cain, they will be punished as well. And that's kind of the summary of the story. And then we learn a little bit about some of Cain's descendants. But what I'd really like to focus on for the first part of the Shior is the, what we call maybe the frame of the story. So the first Pesuk and the last Pesuk of the story, which I think are often overlooked when we talk about the story of Cain and Hevel, just because the meat of the story, what I just described, is so interesting and is so full of conversation, discussion, and conflict. But the first Pesuk and the last Pesuk of the story that frame the story of Cain and Hevel are really a very important and crucial component to the story. And the Tanakh often uses this framing um, literary device where the first pasuk of a story mirrors the last pasuk of a story in order to draw our attention to a specific message, to something that the Tanakh is trying to tell us about the story overall. And this literary device where the first pasuk or the beginning of a story mirrors the end is used very ubiquitously really across the Tanakh. One of the most famous examples of using this framing technique 
is in Megillat Esther, where Megillat Esther starts off with a Mishteh, um, the Mishteh of Ahasuerus, and ends off with the Mishteh of Esther. So we have this kind of frame of the Megillah, which starts off with Amishteh and ends off with Amishteh. And of course, there's Amishteh in the middle there too. But that gives us a feel for the story and provides this kind of literary technique for offering a deeper understanding of the story. So we're going to turn to the frame of the story of Cain and Hevel, which starts off with this Pasuk. And I will read it for you. Um, let me turn to the next page. Here it is. So Adam and Chava become intimate and Chava gives birth to Cain and she names him Cain because Kaniti Ish et Hashem. Because I have acquired man with God. So she then, in addition to that, has her brother Hevel. And Hevel was a Ra'et son, was a shepherd, as I said previously, and Kain was a farmer of Veradama. Now, right away we notice what? That Kain, there's a name, a reason given for Kain's name, Kaniti Ish et Hashem, but there's no reason given to Hevel's name. We are just left hanging. Um, of course, the name Hevel often evokes this idea of vanity, of nothingness, when we think of it as drawing from Kohelet, which we're going to read in a few weeks on Sukkot. Interestingly, um, I've seen those who interpret Hevel to mean fleeting, um, like the air, fleeting, which really does go into or really reflects Hevel's life, which was ultimately fleeting because Cain killed him. Nonetheless, the Tanakh, the Torah, does not give us a reason for Hevel's name, but does give us a reason for Kain's name. And Rashi comments and says, what is Kaniti Ish at Hashem? It means Im Hashem, with God, right? So Chava sees herself almost as a partner with Hashem. Rashi says, Shutafim Anu Ima. God created us by himself, but I created this new being, Kain, with my husband, Adam, and with God. We were partners together. This is very, very different from the very last pasuk of the story of Cain and Hevel, which mirrors the first. And I'll read it for you. Vayeda Adam od et ishta. So similar to the beginning, um, Adam and Chava are intimate again. Vatela ben, and she gives birth. Vatikrach Moshet, and she calls his name Shet. Why? What's the reason for this name? Because Hashem has bestowed upon me this new son um, after Cain, under, in place of Hevel, after Cain killed him. And so this is very, very different from our initial reading, our initial, the first Pasuk, where she says, Kaniti Ish Ed Hashem, her reason for having Cain. And now she says, Shat li Elohim, Hashem has bestowed a son upon me. If you notice the difference in one, in the first one, she and Hashem and Adam are essentially partners on the same level. And at the very end of the story, um, Chava changes the meaning of the name to Shat li Elohim. Hashem is above me, he's bestowed upon me a son, which is very different from her seeing herself on the same level as Hashem. And if we think about the very beginning of the story, it really does reflect this relationship that Adam and Chava perceived that they had with God back in Gan Eden. And we'll go back to that story very briefly. After Adam and Chava sin in Gan Eden, Hashem calls to Adam and he says to him, Ayaka, where are you? And if you look at the bottom here, we see Rashi and Bereshi. I, I believe it's Nakama Price who points out that here, what, what Hashem is doing when he's off, when he's opening conversation, Rashi says, Hashem did not need to know where is, Abra, where is Adam. He knew exactly where Adam was. He knew exactly where Chava was. But he's trying to, he's trying to open up a conversation with Adam and Chava. Says Nakama Price, she says what he's trying to do is giving them an opportunity 
to do tshuva for their sins. They ate from the etada yodea tovara. They ate from the tree of knowledge. And now when they weren't supposed to, and Hashem is opening up for them, giving them the opportunity to confess, essentially to do tshuva. However, Adam and Chava don't take the bait. They don't do tshuva. They don't confess to their sins. Adam is, he immediately blames Chava, and Chava in turn immediately blames the snake. In fact, Adam interestingly not only blames Chava, but he also blames God. He says, You're the one who even gave me this woman. It's kind of your fault, God, and she's the one who made me eat from the tree. And in turn, Chava then blames the snake. Only when you have a relationship with somebody, or in this case with God, where you believe you're on equal footing, can you then pass blame on them. Adam and Chava had a relation, had a perceived relationship with God, which was that they were essentially equal, right? Hashem, this is your fault, or I can cast blame or disperse blame as I, as I see fit. And which really is very reminiscent of the way that Chava initially named her first son, Kai, Kaniti Ish Ed Hashem. We were partners together with God. And this is an extremely important point because obviously what happens later on is at the very end of the story, we see that Chava goes through a transformation. Something in the story allows her to change and her relationship with God is very, very different. It is that you crash my shek, he shot Lielo Kim Zerancher. I understand that everything that I have is given to me from God. We are not on equal footing. We're not in the same plane. Hashem provided for me, and therefore I have a different relationship with him. This then seems to affect her son Shek, who then has it goes on to have a son Enosh, who is who Chali Kravashem Hashem who starts to call out to God's name, to God by name, the Shem Hashem, which is a verse that is also mentioned with Abraham Avinu, who's also Koreb Shem Hashem. So it's through this offspring, through Sheth, and then through Enosh, where this new relationship with God and this preferred and probably more positive relationship with God emerges through this naming from Chava to Shet and then passed down to Enosh. Now, this is all very well and good. And I think that it speaks very nicely to a transformation that Chava undergoes through the story and through the tragic events that happened to her family and between her two sons. Um, but if we really, really stop and think about it, what this message is, what it's actually telling us essentially, and especially if we look at this page, this slide that's up right now, is that in naming her son Shet, Shet was able to acquire or to understand this, this relationship that he had with God, and then pass those messages on to his son, Enosh, which essentially means that we could say the same thing for Cain, right? If it's true that because Shet had this different name, which symbolizes a different relationship with God. Kain's name, which talks about a relationship with God that is almost equal, Kaniti Ish Ed Hashem, or prideful, that relationship with that relationship that Chava bestows upon Kain, that name that she bestows upon Kain, is then passed on to Kain. And so we maybe could say then that Kain essentially is destined to fail. It's not really his fault. All the events of the story and everything that he does and that he eventually ends up killing his brother, how can we really blame him? The Torah seems to be telling us that there's something so important about this name aspect that maybe we could say that, well, it's not really Kain's fault. He was really destined to fail. Of course, we know that that's not actually true. But I think it's, it's an important co concept to think about, the idea of destiny. Do we have this destiny when our parents bestow a name upon us? And it reminds me very, very much of a book called Freakonomics. I think it was published in 2005. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, I found it very interesting. I think there's some controversial parts of it, but it's, a, it's an interesting book to read. And in this book, um, the authors talk about two children who were born in New York, 
and their parents, Nebuch, named them loser and winner. And the authors go on to say that if you track loser and winner through their lives, you'll notice that loser, and I have it over here, Loser was in fact a great, had a great life and he was an upstanding citizen. He was a police detective. And Winner had been a career criminal. All this to say, say the authors, and this is through an interview in one of their recent podcasts in 2019. Um, and we told the story, they say, or Dubner, one of the authors says, we told the story in the book to reinforce the point that naming is not destiny. Meaning just because I have a certain name, that does not create a destiny for me. That doesn't dictate the terms of my future or of my future actions, um, which is an extremely important point. Now, this story is actually, this story and this, these um, findings are based on a larger study conducted in 2003, which is about whether or not the names that we give our children may affect their eventual economic potential. Um, and they, they argue in this study in 2003 that they do not. And the authors here in Freakonomics talk about from a more moral perspective, do our names and do the names that we have impact us, impact the moral and ethical decisions that we make? And they say, no, it actually doesn't impact it. Um, if for those who are really interested, I think this field is called nominative determinism. I wrote it down. So if you'd like to look that up, it's a whole field in and of itself about names and how different names may or may not impact our future choices. But I think that it is clear that at least according to the Torah, we have to view Cain as responsible for his actions. And there's a very fascinating Midrash HaToladot, which was written in the 1900s, so it's a more contemporary source by Manitou. And he says, Cain is the first to be born from the womb of a woman. And in his mother's eyes, he is fully realized or acquired. He recognizes himself as existing in his most perfect form. The whole world belongs to him. There is no room in his, in his existence for anyone else, not for a brother, not even for the creator. He himself is the world, just as Adam is the name of mankind, Adam, in the first generation of humanity, so Cain is the name of mankind in the second generation. From his point of view, he is the entire world, he is the essence of the world in the second generation, and he is perfect. Hence, as he sees it, there is no need for any sort of moral exertion. He has no need to acquire or earn his life. Someone who sees himself as fully realized, Kanui, is guilty of the sin of pride. So according to the Midrash HaToladot, and we'll see in a second, according to others as well, Kain does embody his name. He takes on his name and as a choice. He chooses to take his name on as one that is Kaniti Ish et Hashem, one where he sees himself as complete, as perfect, as prideful. And this, according to the Midrash HaToladon and others, is ultimately a sin that Cain bears for his life. And just like Adam and Chava had the opportunity to do tshuva and Hashem tries to show them the way with Ayeka, so to Cain, he also is provided this opportunity. Hashem says to him, after Hashem does not accept his korban, but does accept Hevel's korban, Hashem says to Cain, im im lo shalba. And the meaning of this verse is uncertain according to the interpretation, but loosely, Hashem is saying, if you do right, then you can be uplifted. But if you do not do right, sin crouches at your door. It's urges toward you. So you may be tempted toward the sin, but you could be its master. You can overcome. And the Radha comments here and says, Lilanda, why is Hashem coming to him? What is Hashem telling him? Remember, this is before Cain killed Hevel. Lilanda derech shuvalo. 
Ladarat Habayim. Says the Radak, this is Kain's opportunity to do tshuva, and Hashem is trying to teach Kain the art of tshuva to him, and also to be passed on to future generations. And this is very fascinating to me because what the Radak is actually saying here is that even before Kain killed Hevel, he has already entered into sin. He is already sinning even before he killed Hevel, which very much is reminiscent of what the Midrash HaTaladot told us previously, that just in Kain embodying the reason for his name and re embodying that aspect of pride, he's already on a path of sinning. He's essentially already entered into sin. And Hashem is trying to, and Hashem is giving him the opportunity to change his ways, to go on a different path, even before he kills Hevel. Lilando derech tshuva. He's trying to teach him the way of tshuva. Maybe we can even say that Hashem is saying, listen, Klein, I know that you were brought up in a certain way. I know that you've chosen to embody this name, this kaniki ish et Hashem aspect but I'm trying to intervene before things get really bad. I'm trying to show you and light for you a new path and a different path. And I think it's fascinating that this is not something that Hashem expects kind to necessarily come to on his own, but it's something that Hashem is trying to help him through, to show him, much like the Ayeka in the way that he's trying to almost hold their hand, show them, this is the way of change. This is the way that you can do tshuva. It's reminiscent really of the Talmud Bavli and Sachim, who talks about that there are seven things. They talk about there are seven things that Hashem created before the world was even created. And you can read the list to yourself, but one of the things is tshuva. Meaning tshuva is something that Hashem needed to give to the world because it's not an innate, a reflexive act. It's not something that we would innately know how to do. And so in the case of Kain, Hashem is giving him a gift. Before things get really bad, Kain, you can be mikaber, you can control, you can overcome this pridefulness, um, and you can go on your way toward Shuba. And the, the question for Kain, we know the outcome, we know that he doesn't, like his parents, he does not take the bait. But the question for Kain is, does he ultimately in some way actually do tshuva? So I wanna turn back to the story and I know that there's a lot of text here, but I've already described the story to you and we'll read it quickly together. And this is the story of the actual events of the murder where Kain kills Heva. And um, okay, so we'll start from the beginning. And it came to be. So Kain brings a minchala Hashem. The Hevel Hevigam Hu Mibkarat Sona Mechal Vehen. By Esha Hashem El Hevel the El Minchato. The El Kain the El Minchato Lo Sha'a. So Hevel brings from it seems like the best or the first or the firstborn of his son of his sheep. And Hashem turns towards Hevel's mincha, but he does not turn toward Kain. So Kain gets very upset and his face falls. Why are you so upset? And here we read the verse that we just read previously, where Hashem gives him this opening for tshuva, according to the Radak. So if you are able, you, you, you have it in your hands to be mikaber, you can overcome this pride as we described it, as we interpreted it. You can overcome this aspect of yourself, this sin. But Kain says to Hevel, his brother, and they're in the field, and we won't get into this. They seem to have a conversation. We don't know what it's about, and there's many interpretations of that. And when they were in the field, Kain rises up against his brother Hevel, and he kills him. Where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And Hashem says, what have you done? 
your brother's blood is calling out to you. We talked about this before and Hashem gives him his punishment. You are going to wander the land. You're no longer be going to be able to farm the land. By Yomer Kain El Hashem, when Kain hears this, he says to Hashem, Gadol Avoni Min So. And we're not going to translate that yet because there are many interpretations for it. He says, the translation here that I've drawn from Safaria is my punishment is too great to bear. I'm, you put an X on my back. I'm going to be um, wandering the land. Anyone who finds me is going to kill me. So Hashem says, fine, you know what? Anyone who kills Kain, I'll take sevenfold vengeance upon them. So Hashem seems to lessen the punishment a little bit for Kain, and then Kain gets up and he leaves. And there's a great machloket around this phrase that I've highlighted here for you in bold. Gadol avoni min so. What is Kain's reaction to hearing his punishment? Says the Ramban, Nachmanides, the Hanachon Bapshat, and it's clear from the Pshat, according to Nachmanides, Shehu Vidui, that Kain is doing Vidui, that it's a confession. Gado Avoni Minsa means that my sin, my Avon, is too great to bear. What does the Ramban say? Amar Emet ki Avoni Gado Milislach Vitsadika Tahashem, Biashar Mishbatecha. Says the Ramban, my sin is so great that um, it's heavy upon me, and you, Hashem, are at Sadiq. And so according to the Ramban, here we have the first instance of true tshuva, that Kain is really doing essentially vidu. He's recognizing that he did something horribly wrong, and he's confessing to the tshuva. Even more than that, I'm sorry this is so strangely laid out, but the dad mikra goes a step further. Not only did Kain do some tshuva, he did full tshuva. And the, and the Dab Mikra breaks this down for us in three ways. He says, Gadol, Meramez Shehitcharet Becharatagdola. When he says Gadol, it's too great. He is regretting his tshuva, he is regretting his action. Avoni, Remez Sheloya Shuvlachtaod. He's saying, My sin. It says that the Dat Mikra, it's a remez, it's a hint that Kain will never go back to sinning again. And means so, remez le bakashat slicha. And from, it's too, it's too much to bear, it's too much to carry, is a remez for asking for forgiveness. So he really goes through what Maimonides, the Rambam, talks about the stages of tshuva. According to the Dat Mikra, Kain goes through all three stages of tshuva, which is really remarkable. Really, Kain, in this, from this perspective, represents the first ever model of complete tshuva. However, the Ibn Ezra rejects this completely and says, and I brought just the English because both of the Hebrew and the English are very long, but the Ibn Ezra says, absolutely not. That's absolutely not true. Kain did not learn any tshuva, says the Ibn Ezra, and I highlighted it here. All the commentaries explain this to mean that Kain confessed his sin. However, I disagree, says the Ibn Ezra. Um, he says, and I bold it in at the bottom, he brings in a series of examples in the Tanakh where avoni does not mean my sin, but rather means my punishment. And so the Ibn Ezra concludes, the meaning of our verse thus is, my punishment, my avon, is greater than I can bear. My avon is too great to bear. And therefore, says the Ibn Ezra, this is absolutely not shuva. This is Kain complaining about his punishment. I'm not happy with this. This is too much. And the Ibn Ezra says the next verse is substantiates this interpretation, meaning when Hashem says, okay, it won't be so bad. No one's going to kill you. I'll make sure of it. 
um, that's giving in, in essence, according to the Ibn Ezra, to Kain's complaints, almost like he's a little kid. This is too much for me. I can't handle it. And a parent kind of gives in to him. Fine. It won't be as bad. I'm not going to. You can watch TV two out of the five days of this week if you need to. Right. Whereas um, our previous interpretations, the Dat Mikra and the Ramban, are really seen as saying, well, the fact that Hashem made his punishment not as terrible is proof for us that actually Kain did tshuva, not just some tshuva, but full tshuva. And we can really read this in both ways, which um, to me, it is fascinating that at least according to two interpretations that we read, that really Kain almost becomes this paradigm of tshuva, even after killing his brother. I think in the end of the day, it really is a machloket. You can read the story in either way. And it really does come down to the similarity for those of us who were here, for those of you who were here with me, as we explore the story of Minashe, the terrible king, um, you'll remember that we also had a machloket about whether Menashe did shuva, didn't he do shuva, how complete was his shuva. And we came up, it was not clear. The reading is not clear. It really can be read in either way. And I think that this is also true about kind. I think from the Ibn Ezra's perspective, even though it's hard to read Hashem's lessening of Kain's punishment um, without understanding that Kain at least accepted that he did something wrong, it's possible for the Ibn Ezra and for me too, truthfully, that it's too hard for us to imagine God lessening Kain's punishment or giving in to Kain after he had been warned about his sin and then after ultimately coming in and killing Hevel. Whether it was accidental, whether it was just happenstance or however the events came about, it's hard to imagine God, or it's hard to imagine thinking of a paradigm of tshuva coming through Kain through that type of act. But for me, what's really most important, I think about the model of tshuva that Kain presents to us through his story, or really the model of tshuva that Hashem shows us through Kain's story is going back to that point immediately before the encounter with Hevel, immediately prior to the killing of Hevel. And so I brought the Pasuk back to you, Pasuk Vav. Remember, Hashem, according to the Radak, opening this conversation with Kain, trying to allow him, showing him the way to Shuva. You sin crouches at your door, and you will be swayed by it, but you can overcome it. This is, for me, the important inflection point and the, an important point that's worth looking at even a little bit more deeply. Rav Aram Lestenstein, Zecher Tzadik Libracha, who was the previous Rosh Hashiva of um, the Gush in Haratzion, he says, sorry, I'll go back for a second before we look at him. I don't want to ruin it for everybody. He talks about in his essay on repentance and his essay on shuva, he talks about different forms of sin. And he first talks about how there's this, the explicit sin, the sin where we are going against an ase or a lotase in the Torah. We are makal al shabbos. We steal. We're not nice to our neighbor, whatever it is, the explicit sin. But then there are also the sins that are more murky. They are the sins that he talks about, a sin, a sin type called shichacha, where we forget, where our relationship with Hashem is in a place of either rupture or we're in a place of relationship with Hashem that's not close, that's subpar. Our relationship with Hashem is somehow fractured. And that's, that's, that's not to say that we're sinning explicitly, but it is to say that we're just not quite right on the right path. And not being on the right path or having a relationship with Hashem that is less than ideal or below our potential, our individual potential for what our relationship with Hashem could be, can then lead us on a path toward, um, towards sin. And says of Aaron Lichtenstein in a lecture that he gave, he says, the verse in Mishle says, pride goes before a fall. But as Augustine noted, pride itself is itself a fall. 
So the relationship of shichacha, of forgetting, and pride is dual. Pride leads to averting one's gaze from God, but it is because a person has not fully apprehended or appreciated God that he is able to be proud. This line for me was very reminiscent of Cain and what he went through in his relationship with Hashem. This idea of pride, that is what ruptures the relationship or leads to shichacha. Pride itself for Cain is the fall. If we think about really the story of Cain and Hevel, Cain is, it is unclear to us, there's no indication in the text as to why Hashem decided to choose Hevel's offering over Cain's offering. There's no indication whatsoever, and so many Parshanim try to jump on it and explain what it was. Maybe Hashem prefers meat over vegetables. Maybe Hashem or fruit. Maybe Hashem prefers shepherds, as we see in the Torah. So many of our great leaders were shepherds. He prefers shepherds over farmers. Maybe it's that Hevel brought Mireshit or Mibcharot. He brought from the best and Cain didn't. It's unclear to us, but in the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Because in the end of the day, Cain's relationship with God was so prideful. It was so full of pride that Cain was unable to accept that God is unknowable and God's choice to the, the choices that God makes in life and the choices that God makes between two people is something that we can't always understand. Cain's greatest mistake in his life was that he never thought to himself, well, maybe God is going to choose me for something else. If we think about it, this model of choice this is the first model of choice that we have in the Tanakh, but in Sefer Bereshit, we're going to go on to see Hashem make many choices between two children, right? Hashem is going to choose Noah to survive, and then Hashem is going to choose Abraham. Hashem is then going to choose between Yitzchak and Yishmael, and then Hashem is going to choose between Yaakov and Esav, and then Yosef, who seems to be the one who's chosen, but then ultimately all of Ne Israel. And the ones who were, so to speak, not chosen, the Asa, the Yishmael, they were not rejected, but they were, they were given also greatness. They were, they were leaders of great and successful and powerful nations. They are the fathers of greatness as well. And Cain's greatest mistake is saying, well, I don't understand you, God, because he had a relationship with God that was Kanifi Ish Es Hashem. And I'd like to read you a little more from the Midrash HaToladot, who talks about this process and who talks about the importance of God giving us an opportunity before we actually sin. Says the Midrash HaToladot, and he's talking to Cain, your outlook is naturally that of a firstborn. It is understandable that you find it difficult to acknowledge your failure. You must recognize that you erred, but you can make amends. In contrast to classical tragedy, where a single critical mistake on the part of the hero leads inevitably to downfall and disaster, God tells Cain, your fate is not sealed. At every stage, repair is possible. History is not a snowball that rolls inexorably downhill, but rather a series of exit lanes along the way. You can change the future if you do well. And, sorry, and Rabbi Tom comments on this. He says in an article that he writes for uh, the virtual Beit Midrash in Yeshivat Haaretzion, he says, here God reveals the kind, the essence of Shuba. In the natural course of events, the future is determined by the past. But the present holds a point of free choice that can change its direction. Regret in the Jewish worldview is not the tragic perception that a misstep is irreversible. Rather, it is an optimistic drive that leads to repair. This is one of the most important components of Shuva that Kain teaches us, or that we learn through the Kain Hevel story. That Hashem gives Kain the opportunity to do Shuva before. He, before his ultimate action of killing his brother. Your fate is not sealed. At every stage, repair is possible. 
And it reminds me of a very important concept in psychology. It's called the ABC. And in behavioral psychology, we use this all the time. And we ask patients or we ask parents to think about A, B, and C. The antecedent to an event, meaning what was it that led up to an event? Or what was it, what was it that happened before a behavior? The behavior, which was the event itself, and the consequence, what happened afterwards. And we always ask our patients or parents who I work with to try to intervene early in the antecedent, right? Before the child actually throws a temper tantrum, try to catch them before. What is it that's leading to the temper tantrum? Is it that they are hungry? Is it that they're not getting enough attention? Is it that they're tired? What is it that's leading to this behavior, which then also results in consequences? And it's very hard to do, right? It's hard to be watching your child to that level. And that's, it, it takes a long time. And it's a whole course of therapy, of course. But intervening in the antecedent phase is what can shift the behavior to a new behavior. And that's what Hashem was trying to do for Kain right? You can, attaching shalba, you can overcome it. It's not easy. You have a relationship with me that is not optimal, but is leading you down a path toward ultimately killing Hevel. But if you change that relationship with me, if you change your outlook, there is a different behavior that can come about. And that to me is very empowering. I think it's an empowering aspect of shuva. That when we go into Yom Kippur and when we're going into thinking about the year that has passed and what is, what is coming up next, thinking about not only the actual concrete actions that we've done over the course of the year or that we will do, but rather what is it about our relationship with God that's the antecedent toward those behaviors, that's pushing us in a certain direction that's almost snowballing us toward a behavior that is less than desirable. And I'd like to leave you with a thought from the Rambam, from Hilfot Yisodei HaTorah, who says that in order to really love Hashem and to fear Hashem, only when we have a relationship with Hashem, where we can understand that Hashem is wonderful, massless of infinite wisdom, then we can lay da Hashem hagadol. Then we can really understand, recognize, and have a relationship with Hashem that is one of all, to know Hashem in his great name. And I hope that as we approach Yom Kippur, we will try to go on a path of, not of kaniki ish, at Hashem, but to try towards a relationship with God of Shat Li Elohim, um, appreciating and understanding what God has given me. So I'd like to wish everybody a Shana Tova. I'm going to stop sharing and see, take a look at the question box. And I thank you all for, for coming and listening. Okay, let's see where we are. Okay. Were Cain and Havel twins? That's a great question. Um, there are interpretations that say, yes, Cain and Havel were twins um, because they're, you know, like you said, there's no mention of another Vatahar and it says Vatasef. So maybe it was a surprise, right? There were no ultrasounds in those days. So it could be that I, there are interpretations that do interpret Cain and Havel as being twins. Love Freakonomics. I'm so happy to hear that you love Freakonomics as well because I thought it was a fun book to read. Um, thank you, Jennifer. That's wonderful. Um, Tova says, who gives birth to Enosh, Shet, or an unknown woman? So Shet is a man, and he presumably has a wife, um, and she's the one who gives birth to Enosh, but we don't know who that wife is. Um, and whoever that was, Sivan, I'm happy to send you the source sheet. If you would like, you can either email Rabbi Kelman or send your, put, send your email to me and I'm happy to provide the sources with you. After the Adam uh, Chava snake and fruit of the tree incident, Hashem's words to the couple are stern, rebuke, and they are banished. 
So that is their last communication with God, at least explicitly in the big crowd, does not try to instruct the couple, repair the relationship. It's true. It is, is it not too, is it not late in the game for Hashem to instruct kind with no previous connection relationship or certainly no positive one? I'm, I don't know who iPad is, but I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Is it not too late in the game for Hashem to instruct kind? If whoever's iPad, if you could clarify your question, I'd be happy to try to answer. Is uplift further away from kind than sin? A sin crouches at the door, thus it is not good or equal. Again, iPad, if you can make yourself known, I'm more than happy to, to have a discussion with you about your question, because I'm not sure I understand fully what you're saying. Kind also did not see God talking with him about the way out of his anger as a special gift. That's true, right? That's true. Kind sees this as, okay, God is talking to me, but he doesn't see it as a special gift, which I think reinforces the point of the Tanisi Ish at Hashem. Beautiful. So I, iPad, I'm happy to stay on with you for a couple of minutes and chat about your questions that I didn't fully understand exactly. But for everybody yes. else, Martha yes. Tomatova. Okay, thank you. First, every once in a blue moon, my camera doesn't work, which is, uh, I think, <laughs> a blank thing. And I, I mean, sometimes I turn it off, but now if I turn it on, so I might as well turn it off. But just let me, I, um, a couple points to make. First of all, Freakonomics, um, I, if I remember, they are the ones who present the theory. I don't know why I'm mentioning that, but just think what's going on yeah. in Texas, that... Yeah. Um, that it's because yeah, of Roe versus yes. Wade that the crime rate went down. Went that, down. That, yes. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, they have a whole related. chapter on that, right? That because of that the is. increase in abortion, people who would have been born in and not to have the proper upbringing were not born and didn't go into life with crime. So that's just a fascinating thing to think yeah, about. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was one of their very controversial right. chapters so, that a lot of people it, jumped on. Just because it's controversial doesn't mean it isn't true. Um, oh, yeah. totally. <laughs> The, the other thing, a, it's a plug for the book. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I, I have it here. I just I haven't looked at it for a long time. But when you mentioned it, it sort of got me thinking about that. Uh, the other thing I'll say on a more uh, on, a, on a whatever is um, the Gadol Avoni means so that's the first thing how I pretty much the first thing the Chamalibuitz taught us. Um, the Machloket, she saw it as a Machloket Rashi in the Ramban. I don't think you quoted Rashi. I uh, quoted even no, I didn't. Right, so Rashi says, beat me, I know. It's a Gadol Avonim. So in other words, we don't know how the cadence of the talk was. Go, Rashi says, is my sin too great to bear? Like, oh, what's the big deal? Like, what did I do? I didn't do anything so terrible. And it's the total opposite, of course, of, of Truva. You know, um, he totally didn't accept that he did anything wrong. What you were saying at the beginning, the whole world was his. But anyways, just, uh, you know, that was uh, one of the first the class we had with um, Nechama. Anyways. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. I see some people message me privately, and I'm happy to. Um, all right. I got one question that if repentance was one of the phenomena created before the world, why did Chav and Adam not use it? Beautiful. We didn't talk about the Bereshi Rabbah, which is a Midrash on Bereshi, which talks about how just because it was invented before, Chava and Adam didn't really understand how to use how to use this repentance or how to use tshuva. And according to the Bereshit Rabbah, when Kaim leaves Hashem, remember at the end of the story, it says Kaim left, I had say Kaim leave Hashem. Bereshit Rabbah says, where did he go? Where is he? They say, ah, he went to talk to his father Adam. And he says, dad, Look how amazing Shuva is. Like I did some Shuva and then God left in my punishment. Isn't that amazing? And Adam, according to the Midrash, says, oh my gosh, I didn't know this is something we can do. I had no idea about repentance. And that's how Shuva then got introduced into the world via Kain, uh, via Kain, excuse me, um, which goes along nicely with our interpretations of the Dat Mikra and Ramban, Nachmanides. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, someone was asking about the significance of 49 days. That's beautiful. That shuva is done over 40 days plus the nine days, or the asterisk you made shuva, but I guess you're not including Yom Kippur. Um, and that the Omer is counted for 49 days. Is this the, the significance of something with 49 levels of impurity? That's beautiful. Um, is, uh, that Israel is midrashically said to have attained. That's a beautiful idea. I think also that there is an idea of we have we have a 
we put a lot of significance on the number seven, which is 49, seven times seven in Judaism, right? The seven, we're now entering the seventh year of Shemitah. We have seven days of Shabbat, the seventh day of Shabbat. We have seven times seven to reach Yavel. So this idea of completeness of the seven times seven or seven is definitely alluded to throughout the Torah, that there is this idea of completeness through the number seven. And that one level above eight is when we're the Shmonat Yemei Luim, that eighth day that we talk about in Sefer Vayikra gets us to like that higher level of communication of um, having a relationship with Hashem. So that's, a, I never actually thought of it in that way. Um, Sivan then continues and says, is there some other significance of 40, 40, right? The Sparty custom is to say Sikha for 40 days. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think 40 is also a number that we see repeated a lot in Tanakh. We think about, when we think about like a full kingship, so a king who has ruled for a full generation, a full number of years, the number is always 40. 40 connotates like, connotes a full generation. So it's another level of completeness that I've seen for sure. Maestra Al wander for 40 years in the desert, which is enough to go through one generation. We see many of the Shoftim in Sefer Shoftim rule for 40 years. It says, Batishkot Ha'aretz Arba'im Shana. So that number 40 really does give us a sense of completion as well as the number seven, but in, in somewhat different ways. Very nice. Okay. All right. Beautiful, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Gemar Chatima Tova. Thank you. Gemar Chatima Tova. My camera's not working now. Hopefully, I don't this happened last week a couple of times or two weeks ago, but uh, I thought it was fixed. Anyway, um, this evening, um, Mark Shapiro is going to give the last, I guess, like share before Yom Kippur on the, the Torah Motion Zoom channel on the continuous series on great rabbinic thinkers, Shaul Lieberman, Rav Shaul Lieberman. And I guess I'll have the sleuth to give the first one after Yom Kippur on Friday morning. We'll, the, the Parsha share will be switched as we did last week to Friday morning, Parsha Dazinu and sort of my, my old Pirkei Avot slot. That's 9.30 a.m. And on Sunday, um, Rabbi Liebtag will be giving a uh, continuous share here on, on Sefer Dvarim. Um, so we will have that um, this upcoming in, in Sunday, and then we'll keep you posted with uh, a couple shirim over on Sukkot, and then our post Sukkot um, yeah, schedule. Okay, everybody, hope to see you soon. To really see you soon, or see me, and uh, thank you, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you so much as always, Rabbi Kalman. Wonderful okay. to see everybody. Okay. Shana Tova. Okay, Gemara Chatimatova, everybody. Be well. Bye bye.